Okay, so uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first session, and our first speaker of the conference is Sabia Sekta, who will tell us about shared cycle theory, topological string, and not contact homology. Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks so much for the invitation. It's really you know, pleasure to be here and to talk about this stuff. So, so, uh, so there will be three talks, and so the first talk, today's talk, will be mainly uh, background. So I will, I will introduce somehow the main uh, parts of the, the story. So, so the con not contact homology. I will start with, and then I will, will move into uh, physics and tell you about. Uh, Karen Simons and topological spin. So, <clears throat> and then um, tomorrow I, I want to explain the relation. So that, that's the, the whole. I, in general, I would be pretty bad at giving credit to the people who actually did stuff. But but all of this originates from a joint project with uh, 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 Lenin and Mina Rinagi, who's maybe not yet here, but so, and uh, Kumran Lafa and and uh, uh, and. Tomorrow I will talk about you know, how we actually relate to these two theories, let's say. And then uh, on Wednesday I want to discuss uh, sort of current developments, uh, so there's a little bit new stuff. So, but anyway, so today I, I will start by, by, uh, by describing the main <coughs> characters in this order. So I'll start with the mathematical part. Uh, so introduce a little bit of Lagrangian uh, uh, differential graded algebras and how they're used to get link invariants by looking at the conormal torus of a knot, and then and then talk a little bit about the physics background uh, and you know, including oh, including some things that I, I think maybe not completely worked out uh, from a mathematical point of view. Many things that are not completely worked out, but in particular this open open ground weakened theory and also the polyfold transition. So let's start in, in, uh, in not contact homology. So the starting point is uh, to try to transport smooth uh, information into the symplectic world. So, so we start by taking a knot or link in S3 and then uh, it's Lagrangian co-normal or all those co-vectors in the cotangent bundle that uh, along the knot that annihilates its tangent vector. So that's topologically just uh, uh, S1 times R2, and uh, <coughs> and it's a, one of these exact Lagrangian sum manifolds of the cotangent bundle of the sphere, and its ideal boundary is the Lissandrian cone order, which is topologically a torus. Uh, if you have a link, it's a torus for each component. So here we think of the unit cotangent bundle of S3 as the contact boundary of, of the uh, of the cotangent bundle. So, so it has the contact one form, PDQ, so it's, it's just the action form. And that, that gives you this non-degenerate uh, <coughs> non plane field, which is a contact structure. And, and the, the Lagrangian torus, in some sense, we can naturally identify with the uh, a small the boundary of a small tubular neighborhood of the knot, right? So it's the boundary of, of all those vectors that are per perpendicular to the knot. So in there we can distinguish one homology class, which is the uh, meridian, so it's the, you know, the little fiber fiber circle, and the longitude, which <coughs> I think here is S one X, and then, and then we, the, this torus is the product of the two circles. So X S X is the longitude, and P is the meridian. Uh, and then, uh, so, so, so basically we, we started from a smooth knot in, in, in S3 or R3, and then we got from there a Lachlanian torus in the unit cotangent bundle. And now uh, we want to apply some sort of Fleur homological theories, so in this case for the Lachlanian contact homology, to this co-normal, and, and, uh, and I will very I will next define what it is, but if you just first think about it structurally, so if you have a if you have an isotopy of of, of your knot, then certainly the Lagrangian torus that you have undergoes a Lagrangian isotopy. So in some sense, if you can find some Lagrangian isotope invariant of of your torus, then immediately you get a knot invariant. So that that somehow is the 
the strategy. And now uh, I, I, I will try to explain the structure of this theory. So the, <coughs> the starting point here is that you would like to, to do some kind of uh, fluoromology for the action functional in this this manifold. So so we have the so if we start from the last line strangely, but we have this one form, the contact one form alpha, and then we look at curves that, that begin and end on on the Lagrangian <coughs> the Lagrangian uh, conormal. And basically we would like to do the you know Morse homology or Fleur homology of this action functional which just integrates the action over uh, over these curves, it integrates the action form of these curves. It, and and uh, to be more precise, we actually look at the positive or non-negative part of, of, of the action spectrum. So, so we, we cut off at zero, and then we want to do the, the Morse theory there. And, and what it comes down to, the first thing we need to find is we need to find the, we need to find the critical, critical paths, and they are rave, so-called rave chords. So they're flow lines of this rave vector field, which is the, the kernel of D alpha. And we normalize it to have, to have uh, alpha action one. Um, and in this case, it's, it's just it's simple. So it's just, uh, if you look down in the base, there, there will be just geodesics <coughs> beginning and ending on the knot and meeting it at, at uh, right angles. So somehow, here's the knot, K, and here's another piece. And then you have a geodesic, which means it at right, right angles. So, so these, these are the, <coughs> these are the uh, Kind of critical points and therefore the generators of our complex. Oops. So, so uh, in fact, the complex won't quite be a complex, but the graded algebra it turns out. But the grading of these these rave chords, so they 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 kind of like like the critical points or the, the double points in the Ronian fur theory. Uh, they are graded by a mass of index, but here it's a simple story. So it's a the, the grading is just equal to the the grading uh, the Morse index of these these uh, geodesics, right? So if you think in R three, it's just a straight line, and you can so here this looks like index zero, and you can imagine other things uh, where you have index one and index two. So basically, critical points on the torus, right? The K times K. So it's, it's a it's a it's a nice situation. So we, we have not so many generators, and they're in, in non-negative degrees. So, uh, as I said, this, this basically is the flow theory. And now, in order to define the differential, we are going to deal with, uh, with holomorphic curves. So, for that, we look at the symplectization of our space. So, basically, you can think about it as the, the cotangent bundle removed the zero section. So, there you have a natural or action, right? You can, you can scale it in this. Uh, setting it scaling here, if I write it like a product with or it's translation. And, <coughs> and, uh, and th this is a naturally symplectic manifold. And we pick an almost complex structure, which is uh, invariant under this uh, translation, and which uh, is a complex structure on the, on the contact plane. And this uh, we will use in some, some, somehow to interpolate between this ray chord and some other ray chord in in smartest way. Okay, um, so but given this, maybe I should draw the picture. Um, yeah, so so given this uh, setup, here it says somehow it's our simplification, and then here is a chord, and so here is R. This is boundary on on lambda k times R. And now, because of, so, so we have a sort of a, this is just the root for C, and so on. And then, then the, the complex structure pairs the ray direction and the R direction. So this is a holomorphic strip. So it solves the de Bohr equation. And in fact, they, they, they serve as nice asymptotics for, for holomorphic curves. So <coughs> the, the thing that corresponds to the third complex or Morse complex here is slightly more complicated. It's, it's, so here maybe for this audience I should turn everything upside down and you're in, in your usual business, but, but I won't. So, so we, we generate instead of a, a chain complex, we, we generate an algebra. 
So we take we take all the rail cores and we look at uh, the unital non-commutative algebra. We wait, so pro product is just stupid. It's just right, you know, letter after letter. So it's a, a, a whatever it's for. And then uh, we would like to somehow uh, encode. So we will have holomorphic curves in the business. We'd like to to encode these holomorphic curves that interpolate between the ray ports, their homology class, and so so we, we use as coefficients in this algebra uh, the group ring <coughs> of the relative second homology of the uh, of the unit containing bundle and lambda. So that's the, there are three classes in there. So there are two classes coming from H1 of lambda k, which is this meridian and uh, longitude, and I write an exponential rotation, and there is one class which I uh, call, so it's T, maybe this Q is E to the T, which corresponds to the class of the fiber sphere in this U star S3. So the coefficients will, will be this uh, polynomial, Laurent polynomial algebra, and then we have a rate force. So uh, we will discuss this when we come, so, so in the set, setup where we replace S3 by some other manifold. And then it will be important to do something slightly different. But for, for purposes of S3, we can sort of pretend that we're, we're, we're in R3 rather. So that's what I'm describe today. So we don't have to care so much about rape orbits. We can forget about them, in fact. And so, so if, 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 if you really, we could really can replace S3 by R3. Um, yes. Oops. Yes. Uh, is it true that any isotopy of a polynomial twice can be pushed on a fiber of the S3? Uh, That they don't meet. I mean, the so sorry. If you want to, if you want to ask the question, is something characterized by polynomial torus? Uh huh. And you should ask the question: Can any isotope? You know, there are more isotopes in S three than in R three. Yeah. Uh, so is that true or not? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. That you can push. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You can forget about. I mean, for isotopes, you can forget about this one point. Yes. Ah, that's true. That's right. I think that's true. Yeah. Is it true? That the null theory for no, not the not theory. That the isotopy is conormal torus. The genre of isotopy is there. Right? Like you want to ask the question. Uh -huh, so for in the uh, not for the not, but for the torus. Uh, but, but they don't. I mean, <coughs> they don't really intersect, <laughs> right? So you have a. So, so, or, so we want to take, you're right, so we want to say that the Chandra and uh, the, well, with their isotope is cross this, this thing over there, right? Um, no, I, I think you can probably, no, I think it's not the case. I think you can wind it, I, I think you can link, I mean, if you think in terms of some kind of surgery presentations, I, I think you cannot. So, so isotopy in the complement of this is not the same as isotopy when you add it. So but, the H2 there is the huh? or there, there is the in the first line? In the, say again, so in the, the H2. H2, yeah, so I, I'm picking some kind of generators of H2 here, huh? right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. <coughs> so I, I'll tell you how, how they work, but, but indeed I think it's, that's, that's, it won't matter much here, so <laughs> the invariants I have here, but, but indeed I think it, that, that you can link it with this last surgery thing so that it actually is not the same. It, it should be harder to, to <coughs> do in the complement of this than otherwise. Yes. Um, okay. Um, now, so for, for the generator, so, so indeed the, <coughs> the relative second homology is. Uh, Gener is about you know there is this exact sequence and somehow the the absolute class naturally includes but the other two uh, are not quite canonically there so you have to pick some splitting right but 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 I I write it like this uh, and assume I pick the splitting okay so so now we we can describe the differential in this DJ so it's a a map which uh, <coughs> is an algebra kind of differential and so so we need only define it on generators and on generators uh, it's defined as follows so you pick a ray board a and you want to 
calculate its differential. So then you count uh, rigid after translations uh, holomorphic curves which are asymptotic to A at the very top and to uh, rate towards B at the bottom. So, so then uh, you, you basically have D, D of A is this B, but then we want to kind of keep track of what is the uh, homology class of this U, and for that matter, here, here is somehow, uh, we need to pick some data, this is not completely canonical, but we sort of pick some capping, capping disks at the rate force, so, so they, they sort of these fixed once and forever, once and forever to get get nice algebraic expressions. And then, once we fix these reference disks, then this uh, curves gives you a relative homology class, right? So the boundary is in lambda k uh, times r well, times r doesn't matter, and then this uh, other thing is is, is, is a two chain, right? Two cycling, yes. But but so 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 then and then we we encode it in this exponential. Uh, notation. And, and, and this is a, a part of a symplectic field theory which uh, was uh, where, where the fact that we have a differential comes from some pictures like this, some theorems like this. So, so basically uh, the theorems say that the, the boundary <laughs> of, uh, or rather if, if you have a sequence of such homomorphic curves, then they converge, the Gromov converge to a broken Several level holomorphic term, which could somehow, in general, look somewhat like that. But but now we are looking in some sense in the <coughs> we we prove that we have transversality, and we're looking at the minimal non-trivial dimension uh, one. And when we glue them, we get the next to the minimal dimension two. And so it can only break up in two components. So so you see that these these kind of gadgets. When you sum all over, over all such configurations, then you're summing d squared, and so d squared is equal to. But in particular, we see why we cannot do just ordinary floor theory. Namely, you can have this splitting that is, <coughs> is depicted there. So you try to maybe start with strips, you glue the strips, but on the boundary there appear some kind of curves with, with two, uh, two negatives and one positive, so you need to account for those, and so you, you, you build an algebra. And towards the third lecture, we will actually discuss a little bit how to get some counterpart of this theory in all genera, and then so kind of a much more complicated story. Uh, but what we see here is that in some sense this is the minimal amount of holomorphic curves you could try to include to get to, to have the theory close, right? To get this where you can see. So, so you cannot do with strips, but this you can do with this, and then that's the minimal. Thing, and that, that's what's called contact homology in this setup, and there is a, there are pictures just analogous to these for orbits, which we will uh, meet oops, a little bit later. Okay, so so because uh, some people here uh, work in, in 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 other versions of floor homology, let, let me give you uh, an alternative definition uh, of this. The and DJ in terms of, of uh, wrapped floor homology. <coughs> or homology. So uh, here, I'm, when I write this uh, wrapped homology, I think of just the linear, the linear uh, floor homology. So there's no kind of many ends, I think. So just just strips. And and now we can take the uh, we can take the the conformal uh, this LK. And, and think of it in T star S3. So I should go some okay. picture. So, so we're now back in T star S3. We take LK. <coughs> and since we work in T star S3, we're sort of forced to put this Q uh, uh, we're, we're forced to put Q equals 1 because there is no, no the homology class of Q is field. And also, uh, the, if, if we look at this full LK, then, then it also fills the, the meridian, so we put also into the P is, is one. But anyway, we have this third complex, which, you know, so I, I'm not going to detail this since we're all specialists or some specialists in the area. So, so you, you pick a Hamiltonian 
which is zero inside and sort of goes to, to infinity and then you pick up the critical points of this Hamiltonian and, and, and you can do for a theory um, and there is a high energy part of this story which is generated by which has as generators ray ports and there is a low energy part which is critical points along the LK so basically there are two in this case if you if you if you're economical and, uh, and that's it and then you count uh, you count uh, fluoromorphic strips uh, interpolating between those um, so, so you have a kind of Hamiltonian interpolation uh, This is the perturbed de Bohr equation, something like that, perturbed with the Hamiltonian. And now you, you get some kind of homology. But now on this homology, you can try to define some operations by looking at the curves that we saw before. So here you, you need to take also a kind of Hamiltonian perturbation. So you pick a you pick a non-positive, I guess, one form, a family of non-positive one forms on the <coughs> over the Mumford space of all these these curves, but then I think it's <coughs> observations of, of Poole that shows that actually these operations which you would sort of first expect maybe is this uh, the complex homology, uh, in fact are not because they they are trivial, so you can homotope them away, so so here you have somehow uh, uh, so I should say something so this is uh, T I guess and this is S so, so you have some of these strip-like coordinates everywhere, and uh, and the point here is that uh, up uh, at the ends you have to have your form, your perturbation look like <coughs> constant times dt. So you take it to be one times dt on top, and here you have constants k1 dt, k2 dt, oops, and and and, and whatever number of such ends you have. But the point is that the condition for, for the theory to be nice is that the sum of these, <coughs> they're all positive case, and the sum of the case has to be bigger than one, or equal. And so now you can sort of pinch one of the case, so at the cost of making the other ones a little bit bigger, you can make this one zero, and then you know that this n has to go to a low energy core. So, so therefore, in, in, in that sense, the, the operation that you define like this, <coughs> And we topically would have to factor through the low energy part. However, if you now look at the quotient, so you take this wrapped homology plus, which is the whole wrapped homology complex over the wrapped homology low energy, the critical points, then uh, <coughs> you have, so then, then the, the operation would be zero. And in some sense, you naturally have a simplex worth of ways of turning this off. So you can you choose the k1 up to km in the simplex so that their sum is you know at equal one, but you kind of turn we can turn this leg off or that one or both or whatever. And so you get a parameterized problem where you add the dimension of the simplex to this equation and looking at the kind of secondary operations you find some curves which look like the contact homology curves and you can actually show that they assembly into dj and that dj is isomorphic to the to the to the one at infinity. So this is the sort of Hamiltonian Fleur theory incarnation of this and, and also why why I mention it is <coughs> because I think it's important from, from this point of view and other points of view really to understand how uh, you can put the Q back in the story in this language, right? So Q somehow disappeared. Maybe maybe you can recover it somehow and I don't know how, but I think this is Important question. <coughs> yeah, so that tells you. Uh -huh. uh, it just says that we have a DJ. Okay. And, it, and it's isomorphic. So by turning perturbation off, you get somehow this isomorphic to the thing of infinity. Uh, not going to be when you say you don't know how to put Q back in, I thought you just told us how. You just you know, include also the Lagrangian, which is the fiber. No. no, I mean, e even in R3, I don't, I don't know. R3 is gone. 
going on three is not gone. So the, you, so the point that when you when you look at infinity, right? When you have all the curves at infinity, then you have this S two class, right? The fiber class. But when I set this up, then I have to fill in the fiber class. So my holomorphic curves, they don't naturally, I don't know how to encode the cube, the, the, the fiber class in here. So here, here you, you see, I, I sort of have to take q as input to 1 here, if I follow my mouse. Right? So th these curves, the curves that define this theory, they don't live at infinity. Right? They, they may kind of go in and cross the here. So I don't really know how to, how to lift them in order to get the q. Right, so, so the next thing I want to explain a little bit about is how do we actually compute this <coughs> contact homology. So, so first I give the idea, idea and then, then we look at a couple of examples so you, you get the feeling. So, so the idea is that, that when you have your, your knot, so, so basically it's somehow one, one calculation, one non-local calculation and the rest is somehow is local. And, and the idea is somehow over here. So the idea is you break it. Break the knot around the knot. What? Yes. You lost your arm. Ah. So, so, so here is the a knot, and then you take some other uh, knot around it. I should have some color, but it doesn't matter. So, so, so if you have another knot, you can sort of put it right next to here. And, and what happens if you think of the cone normals is that you have the cone normal lambda u. That's the that's the uh, cone normal of the unknot. And then the other cone normal, of course, it will be like a kind of very close to this lambda u. So it in fact lives in a in a small neighborhood, and that small neighborhood is looking like one jet space. And if you think a little bit more, you see that this lambda k. Uh, sits in here <laughs> as a graphical uh, graphical uh, Legendrian. So, so basically it's a multigraph of a one form or something like that. There is, some, there is no singularities in the projection but down to here. So, so it's in some sense it's a pretty simple story from that point of view. But now uh, the theorems that we use to compute this thing is that if you look at these holomorphic curves so, so if you look at the homomorphic curves that leave on this lambda k then as I, as I degenerate so I degenerate the, the k towards towards lambda, towards lambda u then in fact they look as follows, so they, they, they kind of generate into very thin pieces that lies, that lies uh, kind of squeezed between the lambda k and then a big, big holomorphic curve that lies on lambda k. So, so this is some sort of a scale dependent uh, thing. So, so basically our task is to understand, if we understand really well all the holomorphic curves on lambda u, and then some kind of Morse theory, basically determined by lambda k in the neighborhood of lambda u. Then we should be able to understand all the holomorphic curves. Was the big thing then to be on lambda u? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yes. Lambda u. So, so, the, so the big thing is supposed to live on lambda u, and, and out of the boundary of that grows some kind of flow trees. Okay. So that 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 will eventually give us some formula, which I won't detail, but. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, but, but before doing anything, it's also interesting to see what, what's sort of roughly the complexity of this, or how big is this algebra. Well, if you look at this <coughs> knot, the, the braiding around the knot, then what, what we're looking at, we're looking at these kind of chords uh, beginning and ending on the knot. And so you can think of this braid as somehow drawn on a on a growing cylinder, rotating, and then you see that, that in fact, 
if you have such a cylinder, then, then <laughs> there, there, there will be only quartz in the beginning when you go, and then you kind of expand, 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 and then you come back, right? So there are, there are yeah, I mean, this is not a great picture, but it's not a bad picture, right? If it is S1, <laughs> coming back, right? So, so basically, you have quartz here, and you have quartz here, and the rest of the quartz, they are inherited from quartz on the surface. And, 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 and for the circle, we do the circle later. <coughs> Geometrically, you always have to have four oriented quartz, but somehow if you move to the Lichardian models, you, you can do with two. So, 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 uh, so basically, what it tells us is that we will have, uh, if n is the number of strands in the braid, we will have <coughs> n times n minus 1 generators of degree 0, <coughs> which is here. And then you will have uh, degree 1 sitting here and here. And then somehow, lastly, some degree 2 things. But it's basically the number of generators in the atlas is <laughs> quadratic in the number of strands. So can you say that again when you, why do you expand and then contract? Is it is an energy argument? Or no, no, I, I just want to make uh, as few ports as possible yes. somehow. So, so, so I, I think of, uh, so I have a brain. And if you just go straight and you really braid like that, then probably you have some quartz in here, right? But if you take the whole thing and draw it on a cylinder, and, and just rotate, and as you rotate it, it's still kind of all the strands separating. Then you will not create any, any geodesic quartz, right? There won't be any local minima between the strands. So you have uh, a it, it, it overtakes. This, this, this motion overtakes everything. Right? I realize I'm confused about something you said before, the yeah, math homology yeah. interpretation. Yes. So what you said, it sounded like you've taken the, the genre in theory and linearized it, the least interesting augmentation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how, can you still see the whole theory from there? Uh, no. You, I mean, so you, you can... I mean, you can set 2 equals 1, but somehow... Yeah. No, you, I, I think you cannot. But I'm not sure, but I, I think you cannot quite. So. The point is that the, 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 when, when you do so, so you can do it, so indeed you're taking the least, you can take a little bit less interesting augmentation, which is putting P to 1. <laughs> so, 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 but, 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 indeed you're, you're sort of losing some information here. That, so you need to, I don't know how to recover it, but, but that, that, that's right. So, so it, it, on the face of it, it looks less interesting, but, but the flavor of the, of the theory is this, if you look at it from, from the, yes. How do you read this green on the, uh, yeah, so the degree, <coughs> so the degree in, 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 in is just the Morse index of this uh, geodesic, right? And so now, if we, if you pretend that you're in R three, there is sort of no Morse index going on along; it's just a straight line. And then, then you, uh, so here, this is sort of a clear minimum, right? And for this one, uh, <coughs> you see. You have one decreasing direction, which is if you push both ends this way, and you have one increasing direction if you if you push them like that. So that's a saddle point, and, and this one. Is, so something like that. So I guess scientific answer is something about curvature. <laughs> right. So so let, let's now uh, let's now actually. Uh, Let's now try to calculate this for the amount. Oops. I, I, <laughs> clearly not controlling my computer, but, <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, so so this is the, the basic calculation. So so we need to draw we need to draw the the cone orbital of the unknown. So here is the unknown, and here I'm drawing somehow the the fiber S2, right? In T star R3. So, in order to understand the conormal lift, I, I just need to understand what happens if I take the round circle, what happens when I lift one such circle, right? So, so here is somehow vector P. And, and I'm drawing some sort of front picture, it doesn't matter so much, but it's kind of clear that it leads to a circle like this, right? So this is S2, and maybe here I, I have it. So. So this is this 
height, I'm pretending something, but, but it's not so important. So I'll, I'll try to. <coughs> can you say what this picture is? Sure, I can say what this uh, I can say in more words. So, um, so if, if I allow myself to work in S3, then this U store R3 is actually the same space as J1 of S2. Um, where you, uh, yeah, I, I don't have to do the map, but basically the p coordinate in here is the is the, the coordinate on the on the S2, right? And then 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 you take the projected so divide the vector into two components. Okay, so so now if I want to draw a Lagrangian in here, I can sort of draw it in J0 of S2 uh, as a as a as a as a multi Graph, right? And so, uh, so basically, what I'm drawing here is I'm drawing these fronts of that thing. So here I have coordinates uh, q, p, and c, right? and, the, and the contact form is dc minus p dq. So, so if I knew c as a function of q, then p is equal to dc dq, something like that. Right? And so. Uh, my c function here is just the, uh, the normal vector times the location. Here, right? So, so now now this is this this thing here is s two, and here is the beginning of my front. So so I'm I'm, I'm thinking of, of the r direction in j zero of s two is just the, this uh, normal direction. Right? So so here it is positive, but over here it is somehow it's negative, right? So that's that's what what happens when I over to here, and up here it, the, the function is zero. And once I have one such circle, then I have all, all of the thing because I just rotate it around, and I get this sort of slightly singular front. So here, here we won't have to resolve it to get generic singular. But nevertheless, uh, this is more or less enough for me in order to understand the full story here. So uh, you see that in for the circle in the plane, there is an S1 family of these binormal chords. It's round. And that S1 family here, here sits over the equator. It's an S1 family of chords. When I perturb it out, I get a short chord C here and a long chord E here. And the degree of this C is 1 and the degree of E is 2. And then I need to, I need to understand what are holomorphic curves. And holomorphic curves in such a picture, they basically correspond to more slow lines. And in particular, if I go from E to C, I see two, two flow lines along the equator. Right? So they, 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 they are the ones that give you this, this equation. And when I want to go from C, this is a minimum in the equator direction, but it can start flowing out. It can start flowing out towards the pole. So it flows up towards the pole. Now there one has to do uh, perturb it generically and see what really happens, but, but let, let's not, uh, let's uh, trust me on this. So, so basically if you draw this flow line, you get the, the, these two lines coming in, if I, if I draw them in the torus, which is the preimage of this projection, then the, the fiber over the north pole is completely crushed under the, the, under the projection. And so the flow line comes in at antipodal points uh, of the fiber. That's, that's, that's this, this line here and that line here. So up to there, we can sort of more or less easily construct the holomorphic curve. But then it has two ways to fall down, you know, one way and the other way. And, and the point is that both ways actually happen. So, so there are two holomorphic disks going from here up to the north pole and two going down to the south pole. And when you think about the homology classes of these things, then you would see that they are kind of in, in four different classes, which if I pick the capping operators, it's this one e to the x, e to the p, and their product. And then one needs to understand what about the q. And basically for the q, you, 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 you take some sort of linking number of the boundary with one fiber located in a nice, nice uh, Okay. So, so basically, this is the <coughs> this is the expression, and you see that the homology, the homology of this algebra, is typically zero, right? If you pick 
if you think of this e to the x, e to the p, and so on as actually complex numbers, for most complex numbers it's zero because some, some unit is in, in the image, but for some of them exactly, exactly where this is zero, then, then it's not. So that, that's the interesting locus, and we will interest, we'll look at that more closely later. So, yeah. Um, <coughs> This is now not, and so maybe I'll just say this. So I'll, I'll get back to the actual calculation a little bit later. But so, so just to get the feeling for what it looks like. So for the trefoil, uh, you have uh, some more generators. So here for the unknowns, the special thing is we have no short chords at all, right? Here we have short chords. Uh, so we have a, it's a two-strand braid. So we have A's and B's. There are the short ones and C's and E's, and, and you get some kind of uh, similar looking differential. So, so just to say something, you see that you can see traces of the unknown differential. Uh, for example, these, these are, are, are exactly traces of this. These are, these are two of the, of the disks we saw before. And then these, these terms are exactly the same disks, but with flow trees attached to it. So kind of, if you look closely, you recognize all the terms except possibly for these ones, but they're pretty boring anyway. So um, that's what it looks like. Um, and in general, uh, one can so the, basically the only thing that you need to understand now is what happens when when a brain turns around. So once you have that, you can somehow assemble the pieces into a differential and. Uh, and the result looks as follows. So, so, so you get a matrix where the, this matrix A contains all. It's somehow it's an economic way of writing a lot of equations. So, so the matrix A contains all the small chords A i j, and the B the equally the B i j's and 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 C C i j's and E E i j's. And then uh, there is a matrix <coughs> that has a lot of A chords in it, and that's exactly what's determined by this twisting. So it's determined from the braid in a completely algebraic manner. And, and, and the differential is, is of the following form. So in particular, one should note that if you look at the degree 1 generators, you get the, some sort of <coughs> polynomials in degree 0 generators from these things. So the, the lambda and is, is encoding this e to the x e and, and e to the p. So that, that's that's the only thing we have to kind of. So can I ask? So yes. So why why are the short chords? Why is A and B so different in these equations? Isn't it kind of short chords and the large chords? They seem to be kind of the same kind of thing. No, but the the the, short, the, the A's are the degree zero, so they're lowest. So 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 since we have no degree minus one or anything, the D of A is immediately zero because of gradient. Yeah, I mean here here yes, in the equations they're not. They don't look similar at all, but the way you produce them, it but seems like you, you started small and made it big and then made it small again. It yeah. seems like making small and making big is kind of a similar kind of operation. No, but, 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 you know, what happens is that basically, you're, you're intuitively, you're supposed to take this chord and you're supposed to flow it so that it gets shorter. Here, you cannot flow at all, so therefore D is, is zero. So here, you can actually start a flow. One, one of them is pretty boring. It just goes straight to here. Right? But the other one is not boring at all. It starts traveling out and travels throughout the whole brain with, with possible splittings and so on. So, so there, kind of a lot of stuff happens. So, so the, these ones, the bees, they actually kind of, if, if you did this in the solid torus, they trace out the whole brain. So, so they know a lot. Whereas A are sort of, it just flows into them. Um, yeah. So, so just a couple of quick comments. So, again, one can do more. Uh, so we can we can find a sort of a string topology description of the DGA for Q equals one, um, and and we will talk about these things a little bit more later. So, so it turns out that the not contact homology as yes, not invariant is uh, in some sense pretty successful, not completely computable, but pretty successful. So. It, it's an unknown detector, and it knows about the A polynomial that we'll discuss more. And, and finally, and I think this is interesting to mention, because there should be some 
possibly some counter because we see it, we will see a lot of connections to Charles Simon's theory and other things, and there may be some kind of trace of this there. So it's the observation that if you have a contact structure on R3, so we're doing this non contact model in R3, and you just take a graph of this contact structure, so if you take the unit length contact form, right? That gives you a graph, so that gives you a three dimensional variety inside the unit cotangent bundle. If you multiply it by R and choose your complex structure smartly, then it's actually kind of sort of one morphic sub variety. And by definition, more or less, if you're not, it's transverse to the contact structure, meaning that it's always transverse to the kernel, then its co normal torus is disjoint from this variety. You have to say something about very coarse, but in this situation, because of positivity intersection, it induces a filtration on the non contact homology, which is somehow is a refinement of this topological you know, invariant, which is actually a, a powerful invariant of transverse modes. So, so I, I think this is a, I, I don't want to detail it so much, but I think it's important to keep in mind with regards to what, what I'm saying next and so on. So, okay, so, so, so now uh, that was the introduction to the math part of, of, of the story, so now I'm going to try, try to make an introduction to the physics part, but luckily Mina is here, so you're today allowed to ask questions. Normally not, but today you can ask questions. Okay. So here's the short assignment. Action. So, so if you have a, a plus three manifold, and, and, and you have an SUN connection, so this <coughs> is just a <coughs> matrix value. Function then then the then the Chern Simons action is the integral of, of the three form as shown and, and this is uh, almost gauge invariant. So if you look at the uh veil theory for for four manifolds, then you can somehow put this thing on the circuit, close it up, and you see that if you change gauge, then uh, this this uh, Integral changes basically by the, the integral changes basically by an integer of the, to some eight pi squared, and then uh, you form the, the, the next observation is that you kind of you want to look at this as a function and you want to see what are critical points, and uh, and it's not so hard to see that the variation is just uh, integrating the, 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 the variation against the curvature of the connection. So so the flat connections are the stationary points the chart Simons actions. And then we now move into to physics and we look at the sort of theory, quantum theory defined by this by, by taking this path integral over gauge mode. So this of course I think uh, mathematically not completely well defined. Uh, but uh, but we're, we're going to treat it uh, as if it was an oscillatory integral or something like that with a quadratic exponential leading term. So, <coughs> so, so um, what happens is that we we can we can Feynman expand this thing near the critical point, so near the flat connections, and and uh, without going into any details, the the you know if you ever did any any Feynman diagrams, you you know that this cubic term gives you such a vertex, but here we have a gauge index to keep track of. And there is a very convenient and suggestive way to do that by fattening the Feynman graphs. And, and when you look at the trace type, tra trace type uh, cubic terms, you see that they kind of contribute exactly when, when, when the thing closes up uh, with the gauge index on the boundary in some sense. So, so our, our, our expansion turns into an expansion over fattened Feynman diagrams, and <coughs> so what is gauge index? So, so you have a so here so so A is a, an n by n matrix, right? So so the, so the gauge index are just these kind of i i j components of this matrix, if you wish. And so when you take the trace, uh, things have to close up like that, right? So I you know it's somehow okay. Um, so, so, so basically, that, that, that's, uh, I'm not going to tell So, in reality, the, these, these uh, things, this, when I say it's a sum, it's actually it's some kind of integral over, over, over products of the manifold, right? With the Green's kernels or the inverses of, of D 
of the twisted differential, uh, twisted differential and so on, but, but let, let me not go in there. And, uh, <coughs> and the, the, one of the nice things about this is that, that, that Witten showed how one can interpret the, the Jones and the Humphrey polynomials in terms of this churn simon theory. So uh, basically, what he showed was that the, <coughs> the, the, the Jones polynomial, the Humphrey polynomial, is actually the expectation value of the monodromy of the connection around the knot. So, so, it's, so, so let me just say one word about this proof because it's somehow interesting from the point of view of, of being a little bit non perturbative So, in the <coughs> so in, in, in knot theory, the whole polynomial is a sort of diagrammatic thing, which uh, which says that you know you. You have a two, so you associate to not a two-variable polynomial in variables b and c, and uh, <coughs> and they are related as follows. So so basically you have this, you know, and, and what do I mean? I mean I have a I mean I have a knot, and I draw it, I project it to a plane, I get the knot diagram. Okay, so I mean it's, it's over under everywhere, and, and but that's not so important here. But now I, I sort of I take this crossing, and I, I take take this into this, and I, I, I sort of take it out, and I can implement, I can put in either one of these three local pictures. So I get three different knots of these in that way, and the statement is that the polynomials of these three guys they're related like that, and so you can imagine that if I'm allowed to use this operation, I can basically unlink anything, so I have some kind of normalization. If I start by saying that this is equal to something, then I can compute for any one. So now, Witten's <coughs> proof that this is actually like that was the following, that this path integral, uh, when, you cut, when you cut the space open, when you, when you take it apart into pieces, one outside, so kind of outside here, and one inside, then the path integral on the outside, path integral on the inside, J should give you two vectors in the Hilbert space associated to this, this, this middle piece, which is in this case just the sphere with four points on it. And, and uh, it turns out that there's a kind of a key thing, and what they, well, maybe many key things, but one of the things they prove is that the Hilbert space that naturally associated to this thing is a two dimensional space. And therefore, you necessarily have such a kind of have such a relation. So this I'm talking about the SU2 theory here, but, but then and then then after that you need to do kind of a couple of, of calculations and then, then you're done. So the, the the but the main the upshot of this is also that this definition is to the extent this definition it works in arbitrary three manifolds, right? So so the other definition certainly does not. You need some kind of projection, maybe you can do it, I don't know what, what's been done, maybe in surface times or or something like that, but in general, no. So this, this one works generally. And we will actually connect back to that. OK, so the other thing that also I'll do to Witten is that in terms of this Chern Simons theory uh, <coughs> is intimately related to uh, amodal topological strings on the cotangent bundle of the manifold. So, so basically, what, what you're uh, Defining here, so I, I also don't want to detail this very much, but it's good to get the feeling of, of the, uh, that there is an actual theory there. So again, it's a path integral type definition, and now we're integrating over spaces of maps of Riemann surface into the into the tangent bundle of the manifold, cotangent bundle of the manifold, with boundary on the zero section. So in fact, you should think of having, in this case, n copies of the zero section. So not just one, but you, they line completely on top of each other, but you can choose which one we end up with. And, and there, is a, there is a Lagrangian, so there is an action which somehow looks something like this. Uh, again, I, I won't go into details. But, uh, but the point... <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you know... Uh, but the point is that, why is it so, so there's, I think that maybe there's a, some kind of 
morality story. Right? So how, when you think about all these path integrals and the quantum theory, you would think that the simplest Lagrangians gives you the simplest theories, but that's not quite true. So the most symmetric Lagrangians that probably gives you the simplest theories. So sometimes you have to live with, with a little bit of, of junk like this uh, in order to get something kind of what you can deal with. And, and the point with this integral, that indeed that there is a somehow there, there is a supersymmetry and, and, and you, <coughs> say, you can show that uh, you know, in analogy with finite dimensional integrals, this integral actually localizes on holomorphic curves. So there will be no, no uh, contributions from non-critical values of this L, but on the other ones there, there will be contributions and they will, you have to now figure out what the contributions are. And, and in, in fact, you need to extend the theory a little bit to take into account variations of the domains. And then you get uh, what <coughs> in mathematics we would call Gromovitan theory. Uh, and in this case, maybe not completely developed, open Gromovitan theory. And, and I, I will, there will be, we will get some information about this open Gromovitan theory from our, from, our, uh, from our study. In fact, you know. Uh, if these were closed curves, then, then it's, you, you get the form on this, if h is zero there, then, then this is, looks like a complex manifold which has no boundary. But in the case when you study open curves, there is boundary, and this boundary will actually sort of come back when we define the, the open goal with the theory, as we will see. Are these curves allowed to be disconnected, or they're uh, connected only? The so, count. so when I take the exponential, I guess this means I count oh, the exponential. All the, then, I, then I count yeah. all the disconnected. Okay, great. So which holomorphic structure I'm supposed to use with T star S? Uh, you can actually use more or less any one that's compatible with this uh, metric. So that, that's that's one one part of this. If if you look at it from the physical point of view, is that this this theory is kind of invariant under certain deformations, and it, it will be independent of the complex structure as long as you pick it. Uh, compatible with with with, with all this. So, so indeed, you pick an almost complex structure, not in general. Right? So, so that that's that's you know that that's also the tricky part of defining this open invariant. So it's not so obvious that it's deformation invariant. Right? But but it, it should be better. Okay. So now when we come to the case of the tangent bundle, then. Uh, <coughs> Kind of easy to see that because you integrate this PDQ, you find there can be no no non-constant holomorphic maps. So that means that somehow all this this theory should come from perturbations of this degenerate manifold, three manifold, which is the zero section of actual holomorphic maps. And and uh, and and and, and Wheaton showed using what he called string field theory, which in some sense is a Hamiltonian, if one could say reformulation of this string theory uh, that, that actually uh, the, it, it gives you back chern simons theory. So the basic thing is that what, what this shows is that in this string field theory only constant <coughs> modes contribute by deformation argument and on constant modes it reduces to chern simons theory. And this constant mode can give higher genus contributions. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. So, so basically coming from the more complicated graphs. Okay. So, but we also have this other written thing about the knot, and, 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 and how we get that into this story is that we, except for the n boundary conditions on the zero section, we allow one, one boundary condition on the co-norm of the knot. And then, uh, then uh, by using, reusing, in some sense, this written theory, which was previously used on all of M3, all the constants. Now the constant curves of interest sit inside S1, right? The LK intersects the zero section S1, so they sit inside there. And then you redo, redo his argument in that case, and you see that it corresponds to inserting this determinant uh, inside the path integral. And if you, if you develop the determinant, then you find that uh, what you're doing is just you're taking expectation value more or less as before, but you're taking trace in symmetric representations. So that's what's called the color conflict invariant. And finally, so I, I, I have maybe kind of half a minute. 
And may maybe it makes more sense to come back to this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll stop at this one. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? Okay. If not, then we'll thank Vias again and resume in half an hour.